Hi, welcome back to another video of Medic Notes. This video will be on leg calf patis disease. Leg calf patis disease, LCPD, is a idiopathic avascular necrosis of the proximal femoral epiphysis, and it affects around 1 in 1,000 of children. This condition most commonly presents between 4 and 8 years old, and it is more commonly seen in boys compared to girls. So those who are at a higher risk of having this pertis disease include risk factors like low birth weight babies, exposure to cigarette smoking, short body length at birth, family history of pertis disease, low social economic status, or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder type 1, ADHD. And their clinical presentation is variable, which it can range from a painless limping of the leg to an acute transient synovitis. If children do have pain, the pain is often referred to the knee, and the pain tends to be worsened by activity and relieved by rest. So those children around 4 to 9 years old who have asymptomatic limping or symptomatic synovitis for more than 10 days should raise the suspicion of pertis disease and we should do some investigation to diagnose it. On physical examination of the child, it often demonstrates hip pain with a passive range of movement. And the range of motion may be reduced, especially in abduction and internal rotation of the hip. Hip flexion contraction may be seen in cases of long-standing pertis disease. So some of the children may present with Trendelenburg gait and also leg lane, leg lane discrepancy for prolonged disease. For investigations, radiographic changes can be seen usually after 3 to 6 months of the disease process. And the investigation that we can do are x-ray which is AP view and frog lateral x-rays of both the hips. So the radiographic changes will begin with medial joint space widening, cartilage thickening and also joint effusion might be seen. Other investigations include fugal count, ESR, and CRP. So this is the staging, which is the Waldenstrom staging of pertis disease. There are four main stages, which are the initial stage, fragmentation, reossification, and remodeling. So for the first stage, which is the initial stage, it is described as the first three to six months of the disease, and it may be clinically and radiographically silent. However, if there are radiographic changes present, there might be medial joint space widening and a small sclerotic epiphysis with increased density in the ossific nucleus may be seen. So it's shown here in the picture A. The second stage is fragmentation and this stage is present from around 6 to 12 months of the disease and it is often associated with clinical symptoms. So radiographically, the epiphysis will show fragmentation you can see in the second picture and also alternating areas of sclerosis and fibrosis and it may begin to collapse in the height. Third stage is reossification, which begins around 12 months and can last until 18 months. So during this time, there will be reossification of the nucleus and it begins peripherally and then progresses centrally as the necrotic bone is fully removed. Gradually, the epiphysis will regain its normal strength and also density. Whereas the fourth stage is the remodeling stage. It begins once the ossific nucleus is completely reossified and it continues until skeletal maturity. So these are the four main stages of pertis disease. So there are a few classifications for this disease, which consists of catheter classification, and this is applied during the fragmentation stage of the disease, which is the second stage, and it is based on the amount of the involvement of the epiphysis. Second classification is Sauter and Thompson classification. This Classification is focused on the extent of the superolateral dome of the femoral head that is affected by subchondral fracture. Whereas herring classification is the most commonly used classification, which I will explain about it later on. So this is the herring classification. We can do this classification by using an AP X-ray view of the hip, and it must be done during fragmentation phase. So this classification is based on the height of the lateral pillar, which is the lateral one-third of the femur head. 
So there are three groups, which are A, B, and C. So based on the height of the lateral one third of the female head, group A is it is normal height. Group B is more than fifty percent of the height is maintained, whereas group C is less than fifty percent of the height maintained. And there is also an extra group, which is the B C border, where the exact height is exactly fifty percent of the original height. So it is also shown in this picture here: group A, group B, and group C. For treatment, Protis disease process is defined by destruction followed by regeneration. And the primary aim of the treatment is to prevent deformity to the femoral head before the remodeling phase and many experts feel that containment of the femoral head is important. So there are non-operative and operative treatment. The non-operative treatment, which is conservative treatment, is usually reserved for younger children, especially those under 6 years old, with herring A or B hips. <coughs> so, which means this normal height of the femoral head or more than 50% of the height still maintained. And the therapies of non-operative treatment include protected weight bearing and activity restriction, physiotherapy, and monitor the child regularly with x-ray over 2 to 3 years. And some medications that we might give are biphosphonates and bone morphogenetic proteins. However, the use of both these therapies remains controversial. For operative treatment, it may be indicated in children with persistent loss in range of motion or unresolving clinical symptoms. And surgery is most beneficial if it is performed early in the fragmentation stage. So the operation that we can do are proximal femoral varus osteotomy and pelvic osteotomy. That's all for this video. Thank you.